This is a quick and easy introduction to the simple roofline model, or as we call it, the naive roofline model. The naive roofline model is probably the simplest but still useful performance model for steady state loops in high performance computing. It is based on some very simplistic assumptions, and uh, the assumptions are so simple that it's actually uh, surprising that we can get anything useful out of this model. First of all, we adopt a very simplistic view of the hardware. The hardware is viewed as um, two units, basically. The execution units of the processor, which can operate at some maximum performance, we call P-peak. Um, this performance is measured in any um, any sensible unit, which is useful to us, for example, in megaflops per second, or megalops per second, or iterations per second, whatever, whatever is useful in the particular context of the program you want to analyze. And the second part of the hardware is a data source or SIC. Usually this is the, um, the main memory interface or the main memory, uh, which can store data or deliver data at a maximum speed, which we call the bandwidth, BS. The unit of this bandwidth is bytes per second, usually. It doesn't have to be the memory interface, however. It could be any data source or sync that you can use in a computer system. So, for example, the disk, a uh, distant node using a network connection, uh, even a cache that resides on the processor chip. Usually, it's the main memory. Okay, so that's our view of the hardware. And as you know, as you see, that uh, this is surprising because it, it abstracts away lots of the intricacies of actual computer hardware, all the complicated in-core features, all the latencies in the system, everything that makes computers complicated is abstracted away. And it's surprising that we can get anything out of that, which we will see about that. Now, so much for the hardware. The software is also abstracted. We adopt the simplicity of the software as well. And the software comprises um, loops. And we look at the software um, as if it were comprised of several back-to-back -back loops, and we look at each loop in turn. So here's one loop. Uh, we assume that the number of iterations in the loop is sufficiently large. Now, what does it mean, sufficiently large? It means that all startup and wind-down effects, like pipelining, prefetching, ramp-ups, and so on, all these effects are negligible. The loop is long enough so that we can assume some kind of steady state behavior. Data is flowing in and out of the CPU. Um, processor units are operating in a continuous manner, probably not all the time, because there may be bubbles in the pipeline, for example, or um, waiting times, latencies, and so on. But all this happens in a regular way, in a very regular way very layered away, so that we can assume um, a steady state situation. So that's what sufficient means. And within this loop, some complicated stuff is happening. You know, loops can be complicated. And um, also, we ignore all these complications, and we assume that the loop does a certain amount of work. Now, the easiest measure, the easiest metric for work is the floating point operation, the flop. Um, so we assume that this, the loop is doing n flops. And for doing those n flops, uh, it requires a certain amount of data. And we call this amount v, v bytes of data transfer. And of course, we have to associate this data volume with our notion of the hardware. So v is the number of bytes of data that have to be transferred to and from the data source in sync we see on the left hand side. Okay, so this, this very simplifying abstraction, assuming that the bytes of data flow through the data source and sync. That's our assumption about data flow in the system. Now we have two numbers on the right. The software is characterized by two numbers, the number of flops done, so the amount of work done, and the number of bytes of data that are required to do the work. And from these two numbers, we form a ratio, n over v, the number of flops divided by the number of bytes needed. And we call this ratio i, the computational intensity. It has a unit of flops per byte. Now, if flop is not the metric you need because you're not doing flops in your code, or your metric of work is something else, something more adapted um, to the program, then you can do that. And um, it could be n, 
letter side updates or n inner solver iterations or it could be n uh, problems to solve whatever whatever is useful as a metric of work you can use in your computational intensity and accordingly the unit of i could instead of flop per byte also be letter side updates per byte or iterations per byte Now, the main question that a uh, performance model tries to answer is how fast can tasks be processed? And uh, if we adopt for the moment the flop as a useful metric of work, um, this means what is P? What is the expected performance in flops per second? Now, uh, if we look back to the uh, simplified view of the hardware, there are actually only two possible bottlenecks that may apply here. The first bottleneck is the maximum number of flops that can be done by the hardware, which is limited by p-peak. And the second limit is uh, the data path bandwidth in bytes per second, ES. So it's either one or the other. Okay, The bottleneck is either the execution of work, and if this is the case, then the expected performance is p-peak, or the bottleneck is the data path. Now here it gets a little bit more complicated because uh, we need an expectation in terms of flops per second. Data path is characterized by a number, ES, which has a unit of bytes per second. And we have another number which characterizes the code. Uh, this is the intensity, I, which has a unit of flops per byte. So, how do we plug together these two numbers, flops per byte and bytes per second? We multiply them to get a unit of flops per second, I times BS. I is a measure for how much work is done for every byte transferred. And BS is a measure for how much bytes can be transferred in the first place. So if you multiply the two, we get a flops per second limit. Now both these numbers, P peak and I times BS, are obviously upper limits for the computational performance. Well, if both are upper limits, this means that at any time, the upper limit for the final performance P is the minimum of the two. So the expected performance, or to be more exact, an upper limit for the performance is the minimum of the peak performance and the product of the intensity and the bandwidth. P equals min of P peak and I times PS. This is the roofline model. Now, what does it tell us? Now, in order to, to get a grasp on this, um, a simple graphical representation is often used. So we use this, this plot. On the right axis, we plot the intensity. On the y-axis, we plot the performance. So we can draw these two functions in the two arguments of the min function as straight lines into this plot. The first function is a constant, p-peak. So this is why we plot um, p-peak as a horizontal line. It does not depend on anything. It's a constant. The second line is also straight but it's a product of I, I and BS. I is the X parameter, intensity, and BS is the constant bandwidth of the system. Now, of course, this is a linear function with a slope of um, BS. And the minimum function, as shown in the roofline model, is displayed in the plot as this red line the minimum of those two linear functions. P is the minimum of I times PS and PP. Now, as you see, since we've abstracted the software down to a single number intensity, the x-axis position on this diagram gives us the quality of our code. It's the only code quality that goes into the model, the intensity, a single number in flops per byte. So if the intensity is low, so much to the left of this knee or inflection point, we're limited by the data path. And if the intensity is high, if we're at the right of this inflection point, then we're limited by the peak performance. So at high intensity, the performance is limited by execution of work, and at low intensity, the performance is limited by the data transfer. Now, of course, this knee, this inflection point, has a special meaning. Um, this is where the peak performance is the same as the product of intensity and bandwidth. And 
Well, what does it mean? What is the significance of this point? The significance is that at this point, if you're running at this point, then your software makes use, makes best use of all the available resources in the simple model. It uses the full main memory bandwidth and it uses the full computational performance of the chip. So, for example, if for some reason you have a choice um, over uh, which which model of processor to use for your program, and you can choose it so that your program runs at the roofline knee point, this is the best use of resources. Incidentally, this is also the point where the processor draws most of the power, because all the data paths are used to full capacity, and all the computational units are used to full capacity. So this is a point where the power peaks. Now it's very important to understand that the Neve Roofline model is an optimistic model. Now what does it mean? This prediction P as a minimum of P peak in I times PS is a prediction for the light speed of the computation. Light speed in the true sense of the meaning in physics, light speed is something that cannot be surpassed. So uh, your program can never run faster than what the roofline model predicts. And this is entirely self-evident because P-peak is obviously an upper limit for the performance. And I times PS is also an upper limit. The program can never run faster than I times PS. Which means automatically that if you set up a roofline model and you uh, establish an upper limit of P, uh, from the roofline model, and then you measure the performance, and if the performance is higher than what the roofline model predicted, something must be wrong. Okay, so let's apply this roofline model in practice in a very simplistic setting. We have two machine parameters, the peak performance, p-peak in flops per second, and the memory bandwidth in bytes per second, and we have a single code characteristic, the computational intensity i in flops per byte. Now let's assume a machine with a certain p peak and a certain um, bs. In this particular case, the peak performance is a measly 4 gigaflops per second, and the memory bandwidth is 10 gigabytes per second. So this, by modern standards, this is a very slow machine, but uh, it will do for this purpose. So when we draw this diagram, only drawing the function minimum of i times ps and p peak, this is a pure parameterization of the machine. There's no code quality involved here because we have not chosen yet a point on the x axis to specify the computational intensity of our code. Okay, so this is a pure machine property. These two numbers parameterize the machine. Now, of course, we need the application property too to get a prediction. And as an application, we choose in the gray box here, we choose the vector norm. So we add the elements, um, sorry, we take the elements of an array A, multiply each element by itself, and accumulate it into a summation variable S. The intensity of this code is easily calculated. Each iteration of the loop uh, requires to do two flops, a multiply and an add. And it requires 8 bytes of data transfer because A is a double position array and each element of A needs 8 bytes. And of course, even though we use A of I twice, the second time it surely comes from a register or at least from the cache. So each A of I only counts um, for half of the data traffic, which means we have two flops for 8 bytes of traffic, which, uh, by which we end up with 0.25 flops per byte as a computational intensity. Now this is our intensity, 1 over 4, 0.25 flops per byte. And the roofline model now tells us the y value of this function, minimum of i times bs and p peak. And in this case, we end up at 2.5 gigaflops per second. Now the fact that we hit the bandwidth ceiling of this model immediately tells us that this code on this architecture with these machine properties is memory bound. It's limited by the memory bandwidth of this machine. And the, high, the upper limit is 2.5 gigaflops per second. If the intensity were higher, for example, if we had a code with an intensity of one flop per byte, then we would end up hitting the peak performance ceiling and we would be limited by the computational peak performance of the machine.
So um, the roof line model is a model. And if you're a scientist, you know that models require to specify exactly what the prerequisites or the assumptions are that go into these models. Now, for the roofline model, we need some prerequisites. For example, we need to have a clear concept of work and traffic. We need to know what work is. Usually it's flops, but it could be anything like shift and mask operations, updates, iterations, whatever. Um, so we need to be able to quantify the amount of work that goes into a loop. The traffic is the required data to do work. And to be more exact, traffic is the required data to be transferred over the bottleneck data path, the one which you have chosen or identified as being the bottleneck of the computation. Now, I need to be able to quantify this traffic, and this may be very simple, like simple streaming loops, such as our vector norm example. It may be more complicated where um, data reuse from cache levels is required. The attainable bandwidth of the code, the, the bandwidth that a code could possibly achieve on the system, is an input parameter. Usually, you determine that by uh, measuring the saturated bandwidth of the chip, for example, via a streaming benchmark. Or you could also look it up in the vendor documentation, but you have to rely on then the assumption that uh, your machine can actually achieve this bandwidth, which is not always true. In practice, modern processors can achieve between 70 and 95% of the theoretical memory bandwidth. And so to, be, uh, to have an accurate model, usually we measure the attainable bandwidth beforehand uh, in order to parameterize the system using this measured bandwidth. And now come the two most important assumptions behind this model. The first assumption is that data transfers and core execution overlap perfectly. Actually, um, a consequence of this assumption is the minimum function we put into the roofline model, the minimum of p, max, uh, p peak and i times bs. Behind this assumption is the, uh, the underlying assumption that data transfers and core execution overlap perfectly. Either one is the limit. Either it's core execution or it's data transfer, not both. And even if those two are very close together, which means in terms of the roofline diagram, even if you're very close to the knee point, to the inflection point, the slowest limiting factor wins. If one factor wins, all others are assumed to have no impact whatsoever. Another assumption is that we ignore latency effects. Now, as you remember, uh, the machine is characterized by the peak performance and the main memory bandwidth. Uh, it's only the bandwidth, not any latency, so latency effects are ignored at all. And um, which, is, which means we assume perfect streaming mode. Whenever data flows, it can flow with the highest possible performance that the data path can deliver without any waiting. And the last assumption is steady state code execution. We don't have any wind up and wind down effects. Every loop is assumed to be long enough to be able to um, assume steady state execution. Which means that if you have a code that comprises a thousand loops and each loop only has three iterations, uh, the roofline model is not a good way to, to try to model the performance of this code. 